thrilled to have him here. Keith Ferrazzi is the CEO of uh, Ferrazzi Greenlight uh, Research Institute. He's written two number one New York Times bestsellers, Never Eat Alone and Who's Got Your Book, Who's Got Your Back. Um, he was a former CMO of Deloitte and the former CMO of Starwood Hotels, and he's an active columnist for Harvard Business Review. So with great pleasure, Keith Ferrazzi. Keith, please come. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So we, we run a research institute of human behavior change. So how many of you in this room would like to change someone's behavior? Raise your hands. Yeah. Did you bring them with you to this event? You did, exactly. Um, it sounds kind of extraordinary, and it, and it is. Our mission is to crack the code of human behavior. There's a lot more science engaged in behavioral science today than there ever was before. Um, but certainly from the perspective of why you're here, disruption and innovation, you all know that as you get great ideas, you have new strategies, you're going to go back into your organizations. You may re-engineer processes around these brilliant ideas. And at the end of the day, somebody has to change their behavior in order to achieve the business results. Does that make sense? And that's what we focus on. Why is it that after great strategies, great intention, great process, new technology, people still do the same shit, right? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, when I originally started the company, we thought that we were going to be based on psychology. And so we hired a number of psychologists, psychiatrists. It was fantastic because they could medicate the whole office. And, but in addition to that, I thought this is really, this is going to be great for me personally because I needed it. Um, but what we found is how, how old do you think psychologists and psychiatrists will say that your basic competencies, your basic interdependencies, how, at what age are they locked and loaded? Raise your hands. Uh, if you think it's, uh, well, shout it out, shout it out. Six, three, five, th it's between three and six, between three and six. So that depressed me and I fired the shrinks. <laughs> I need to find other scientists, right? So we went out and we found some sociologists. Um, and by the way, we still have some psychologists and psychiatrists. We still need medicated. Um, the, the sociologist told us, and it's interesting, because sociology is really the study of society, but it's the study of interdependencies and culture. And each of you have your own sociology. And many of you are the curators of the sociology of your companies. And we found that very interesting because we don't want to work, if we can, against the, the sociology. But in some regards, it's also working against us. Because most of you would say that what you're trying to achieve at some point is going to be, quote, changing culture. Is that right? Yes or no? Yeah. Um, we also found, when, when I finally found, I think, the greatest scientists out there, not the behavioral scientists, which we're all calling ourselves that now, because it makes us get paid more money, but it, it's the anthropologists. Because at the end of the day, 70,000 years ago, whatever you're trying to achieve, if you're working against the basic nature of humanity, you're not going to be successful. At the core of all of us 70,000 years ago, we were born in tribes. 17 distinct tribes born in Africa, were the, born, were the basic nature of human society. And today, we still function the best when we're interdependent. We function the best when we're in our tribes. And the question you've got to ask yourself is around this movement that you're creating, the movement that you're creating around innovation and disruption, it is a movement, and the question is, are you a tribe of one banging up against the sociology of your organization, or in fact, are you able to create a tribe around this movement? Because once you relax into how people are hardwired, they're going to be more successful. All this making sense generally? Okay, well, I'm going to get into some of the details. But before I do, let me actually tell you some of the research that we do. Some of our research is funded by some of the people in this room. Cisco funded a good two years of our research asking the question, in an increasingly virtual world, what are the new people rules? Like, how do you run a staff meeting virtually? How do you run a leadership offsite virtually? How do you give uh, performance reviews virtually? How do you manage your boss virtually? You notice I said, how do you manage your boss virtually, right? All of these questions, we did two years of research and we published probably about 12 to 15 pieces in Harvard Business Review along that period of time. If you just look up my name and new people rules, or just look up my name in HBR, you can see all those pieces. So I thank Cisco for that. Um, we're working on a piece right now that's very interesting because there are some massive shifts going on in organizational design and we're looking at the question of how 
does the way the organizations are managed today prevent people from developing themselves? There is a crisis of frontline management today. We have flattened organizations through reengineering, taken out so much of what was used to be called informal learning, the time that people had to coach, the time that people had to experientially learn. And as a result, frontline managers are now player coaches, which means they're not coaching, they're playing, which is why companies like BetterWorks are so poised to add tools to help augment some of that, some of that informal learning going on in organizations. And <clears throat> that piece is being funded Interestingly enough, by a set of universities who are trying to figure out how to be more relevant to you in corporations on how we can actually fight the negative trends of employee development. Uh, that's really early on right now. Um, sometimes we, we fund our own research. Sometimes we fund our own. And in our own research, we do really crazy things. Like this piece, which I have about 30 copies of, called Managing Change One Day at a Time, that we published in Harvard Business Review. We, look, we, we don't believe most of you know how to change behavior. Most of your corporations are not where we find best practices for changing human behavior. We've got to go to other places like Weight Watchers that has the highest statistical significance of being able to shift change in, uh, in people's weight. We, we went in this case to, well, by the way, I believe that your cultures have something in common relative to behaviors you're trying to change. They're addicted to them. I use that horrible word, but everybody in this room has a culture that you're addicted to behaviors that aren't serving you well, because that's all an addiction is. It's a behavior that doesn't serve you well, but you do it anyway. Does that make sense to you? What are your addictions? That's the first thing I'd like you to be thinking about today. What are your addictions? What are your corporate addictions? What are the behaviors, as you begin to innovate and think outside of the box and think about disruption, what are the behaviors that your organization is addicted to that's going to be predictive of not being able to fulfill your innovations? Make sense? What are your addictions? Um, so as we study those things, we actually went out and studied uh, hundreds of 12-step programs and which ones worked well and which ones did in particular groups. And we wrote a piece called Managing Change One Day at a Time in Organizations, where we correlated how um, individuals can extricate themselves with and through the help of a support group called an AA program or a narcotics uh, program, et cetera, and actually shift behavior and what you can learn about it as a corporation. I've got a, a number of copies if you're interested. We did a, um, we, we went out and studied ORCA trainers because we actually fundamentally believe I will learn more from understanding how you, what are the tricks and tactics to make a big mammal that is a thinking big mammal change behavior despite their desire to do so. Um, and we think about how do you bring that into the workplace. Um, so this is some of the fun, crazy stuff that we do. And then, um, then what we do is we apply it uh, in a nonprofit. And our major focus is foster care and orphanages, but particularly when you have children who, from a very early age, have been taught a certain regiment and a certain set of practices and behaviors that will not serve them well. My foster son was in 32 homes before he came into ours. Think about the behavioral addictions that caused that repeated extrication from a home and how do you reverse that, right? And so a lot of the things we're going to be talking about today are equally as applicable to your teenagers. In fact, I give a, a talk at Harvard Business School every year called um, Changing the Behavior of Your Teams and Your Teens because most of the executives at the table in your organization are nothing more than wounded children trying desperately to hold on to old belief systems and old mindsets and old addictions that make them feel safe. And that's, at the end of the day, what we're talking about, which is safety. You've got to make people feel safe, which is as we move to the first slide, you've got to open up porosity of change. You've got to open up porosity of change. Porousness is the absorptive factor. I, I spent some time in imperial, uh, imperial chemical industries, and at ICI, you learn what, a, what, what does it mean to be porous, to be absorptive, to be uh, capable of influence. How many of you walk back into your organizations from this extraordinary event and open up the porosity to receive what you have to share? That's your major objective as you leave, not to push your ideology, your philosophies, your concepts, but to leave here and ask yourself, how am I going to make the organization porous to what I would like to to be able to have them open up to. Is this making sense to you? We're going to actually get into some of the details of opening up porosity. Um, from a corporate perspective, uh, when we apply this work, we've, we've had the blessing. My father was an unemployed steel worker in the 70s in Pittsburgh. 
And um, we've now had the blessing of, of being able to work on the behavioral transformation at General Motors, shifting a group of um, district managers who are calling on dealerships and have a relationship with dealerships from that of auditor controller to that of trusted advisor. Because if they don't have a partnership with their dealerships and their go-to-market strategy, they're not going to win. Um, at BASF, we're working on a certification process around how do you manage and create some sense of formality around the interdependencies of living in a matrix. The world has changed. You live in matrices. Nobody has accountability, responsibility, and control for getting stuff done in your verticals. You have to figure out how do you create systems and processes to manage across a matrix and those, non, those only influence-based um, interdependencies and rules. Making sense to you? Working with BC, BASF on, on that. Um, and then finally, we've launched a new tech company, which I'm very excited about, that thinks about how do we begin to use technology to augment the coaching process, not on the KPI side, but actually on that daily coaching of new behaviors to an organization. And what we focused on is how to re-engineer the relationship between frontline managers and their employees using technology augmented tools. And I've got another piece from HBR. We specifically focused right now on the onboarding stage, and it says technology can save onboarding from itself. I've got some pieces for you. So now, let's actually put your, let's put your behavior chains plans together. There's four things we're going to talk about today. Number one is opening up porosity and change. The next one is realizing that your job is not to change everything, but only to change the highest return practices. Then we're going to focus on the role model community, which is how do you use and create tribes to make your change occur. And then finally realizing you don't train this stuff, you can only coach it. Small doses of incremental change over a period of time is how you change an orca whale. It's not just by understanding knowledge. Knowledge isn't enough to change behavior. If it was, we'd have no obesity or smokers, right? So we need different ways to move. So people talk about trust, and now we're going to talk about porosity. Trust has to do with people. There's lots of ways to break down trust. The leading way to break down trust is when interpersonal dynamics break down. And one does that through cutting through prejudgments or prejudices that people have. People have prejudices of you and your roles. You're, you're, the, you're the rogues. You have prejudice associated with you. When you go back, people are instantly dismissing things that, that you have based on the prejudice of my buddy Sam from Ingram Micro. Right? So how do you cut through the prejudice? You cut through the prejudice through increasing empathy. Empathy is what you're trying to achieve when you're trying to achieve porosity. Empathy. Empathy is achieved not through knowing or not through being better or not through being right, but in fact, empathy is created by being human, by having that relational permission. The relational permission to open another person actually has to do with vulnerability. The way you create us, the way you create tribe, is not by being distinct and different and this antagonist, but instead it's by joining and being a part of us and then asking them to join, if that makes sense. There's a number of specific rules we can talk about and how you use, how we found statistically you can use levity effectively, how your ability to call out the pink elephants, etc. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to build is empathy. Second box, you can't change everything. You should ask a simple question. This is the killer question for behavioral change. Don't change a lot. The, the simple question is, of all the things you're trying to achieve, ask this question. Which fewest people changing, which narrowest set of practices will give me the highest return early investment? So if you try to do more than is absolutely necessary to get the early wins and the early accelerated results, then you will fail because people can't do everything. It's not about changing my diet. It's about not putting cream in my coffee this morning. Those are the tipping point behaviors and practices that allow to unleash downstream possibility. So this is, this is where the Deloitte's of the world and other people come in. This is the, the deep analysis and assessment that comes in to understand what are those high return practices. But you have to make sure that you're focusing very narrowly with the narrowest constituency. 250,000 people at General Motors, we focused on 1,000. Always, always, always one of those subsets is at least the 15 executive committee. Always, always, always the 15 executive committee. And most of what the responsibility there is, is to shift the, shift the executive committee from, how, how many of you would like your organization to be more collaborative? Raise your hands. 
Now, of course, how many of you would like your organizations to take more risks and give a damn about each other's success? Raise your hands. So is that the way your executive committee is run? How collaborative and how give a damn about each other's success is your executive committee? Okay, there's your problem. So you've got to make sure that you exhibit the relational behaviors at the executive committee and you create and you shift your, your executive committee needs to move from being all report outs, which is like reading to fifth graders, to 50% to 70% of your time collaborative problem solving. Your agendas need to have pre-reads with collaborative problem solving. Now all of a sudden, the collaboration across divisions and silos happens there. What I say to leaders is, how dare you use the very rare time that you have your team. And if you think about yourself as a coach, how dare you use the time that you have your team on the court for practice and not make them practice the behaviors you want them to practice when they're not there. You own your team very rarely in terms of being able to control the whole agenda during your staff meeting, you do that. Um, belonging. You've got to make sure that people feel us. And the way you do that is you start by only focusing not on those who do not achieve the change, but actually focus on those who do achieve the change and recruit people to the role models. You've got to identify the role models and recruit people into role model behavior. Celebrate the role models. People will want to gravitate to that spotlight. Many of you spend too much time on that and that group in the middle, the Missourians, the I told, the I'm just waiting to see kind of group, that's the group you're recruiting. That's 60% of your audience and you're going to recruit them over there. Not the eager beavers, the ones who everybody roll their eyes because the first one shaking the pom-poms, the brown nosers. They're the ones that are so excited, probably people in this room, but half of you guys are that, right? You're like, whoa, do things. Um, just kidding, not really. Um, <laughs> but that, that particular group you got to be careful because if you're trying to be a protagonist and antagonist and you end up celebrating somebody just because they were the front of the line, being excited, and the rest of the organization knows that you can't achieve, then you're going you're gonna to lose. And then at the end of the day, you coach. Coach, 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 coach. 70% of the way we learn is doing stuff. 20% of the way we learn is getting contextualized advice. Only 10% of the way we learn is by knowing stuff, which is training, not successful. Coach, 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 coach to success. That's it. Thank you.